I mean, that is the number one reason why um, parents think that they are doing it for their kids by asking them to do engineering and doctor. But I would argue that they're doing it so that they look good in front of their friends. For sure. I had an assistant who left for two weeks on vacation. Hmm. And I never noticed that she went away for two weeks. I had like three or four assistants. Okay. So when she came back, she said, oh my God, I, you know, I went away for two weeks. And inside I was like, you went for two weeks? I didn't even know. You want an assistant that says, I'm going. And the next day I feel it. I'm like, where is this person? Hmm. That person will not be fired right. or will be the fired the last. Uh, like if I had to break uh, people into three categories, poor, middle class and rich. The poor people, they get their money, which is their income. And then all of that goes into expenses. The middle class people, they get their money. That's the inflow of cash flow. That's their salary. It goes into liabilities like cars and houses. And then that again becomes expenses and everything is out. So that pipe goes out. What the rich people do is they take their salary put it into assets, that asset generates more money to her income yes. instead of going into the expense column. Yes. And that is the mistake which most people make. They don't understand that. In 2023, you know, we're in uh, September of 2023. I would say the best time for you to become wealthy in real estate, best time for you to become wealthy in entrepreneurship, and best time for you to have business growth is here. Hey guys, welcome back to another podcast where we talk to the top 1% of successful people in the world. And in today's episode, we have someone really, really special. Someone who has an impossible rags to riches story. This guy actually began his journey in the slums of Delhi and is now ending up working with some of the most successful entrepreneurs in, in the world and is himself a very successful entrepreneur. His name is Sunil Tulsiani. Sunil, thank you so much for being a part of this show. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, in today's episode, uh, we want <clears throat> to kind of um, educate the audience here about how exactly uh, do they build a life which they really enjoy living. Because in today's world, if you see so many people that I talk to tell me that, uh, Sharon, I'm not liking the job that I'm doing. Sharon, what should I do next? What is that next big opportunity? And when we were talking earlier, I when I heard your story uh, from where you began to what you're doing right now, uh, that is a dream journey for most people. And most people confuse, you know, success with just working hard on one thing and kind of, uh, you know, making a lot of money. And, and they think that is the answer to everything. Uh, but when I spoke to you earlier, I realized that there are so many other uh, non-obvious things or non-technical aspects, which actually defines how, how much successful you will be in life. So before we dive into that and educate our audience, I actually wanted you to tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, your entire journey, right from, uh, you know, uh, you as a 10 year old boy, yes. uh, all the way to today, uh, to whatever you've built. So I was born in India and uh, <clears throat> father was a factory man. And uh, when I when I remember back, Delhi was the place where I remember back, my, my mind goes back to four years old. And then we lived in a poor family. Uh, and we, we, we would live as a as a, a paying guest in other people's uh, apartments and it was five of us and that was our one room was our bedroom we would fold everything away every day in the morning and then it become a kitchen we would share washrooms and we had no toilets we had no running water and we had no electricity so I went from that kind of environment to where I am, what people would consider to be an abundant lifestyle and, and a successful lifestyle. And uh, so can you tell that first? Can you tell what you're doing currently? And then let's fill in the gaps as to what the journey was so that people know, okay, that is what you were and this is what is today. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate you. I'm uh, turning 55 this year. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. And uh, I. So, as a 55 year old man, what are you doing currently? Yeah, so, I am the founder of Private Investment Club, the top elite real estate investing club in North America, including Canada and United States. And, uh, and also I'm an investor, I'm a best-selling author, as well as I'm an international speaker. And this is something in millions of years, I would have never thought that yeah. I would be that guy. Please help us understand how that, that does that happen from, from being in a slum to being a multimillionaire. How does that journey go? Please explain that to us. So first, I want to tell you is that I, I'm an introvert, even though when people see me on big stages, I just was at the growth summit with 5000 people and people think that I'm an extrovert. Actually, I'm a very introvert person. But when I get on the stage, it's different because I feel I'm connected with somebody above. Right. And that's how the, the information comes through. So I was shy. I was introvert. I am introvert. 
a bad student. Mm. <laughs> Not didn't do well in schools. Didn't like schools at all. What are the scores in school? I, I would say that if I pass, my father would say, "Pass to like, so forty percent." Did you pass at least? Uh. You know, at least did you pass? Uh. Because it was before. It was like uh, you know, make sure you get eighty, ninety, be first in the class because you know they gave. That was me, by the way. I was. you know always that person or i was motivated to be that person by yes, my parents yes yes and 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 a lot of times i didn't like those people because <laughs> you guys made me feel like bad sometimes right but you know what's growing up uh, what i realized was that um uh, that that the schooling made me feel like i am the fish who is being asked to climb a tree uh, but can you tell us about how you ended up in canada yes and then actually became a police officer and then became a detective <laughs> in canada so can you tell us how that happened yes uh, so when i went to uh, my father was a factory man and uh, they needed um a pattern makers which is a position uh, making patterns and uh, my uncle used to live there and my uncle said it basically helped us get there when i landed there there was this older car that my uncle brought and then he drove and we came to this building where he was living i thought oh he owns the whole building <laughs> then i realized no no there's a one apartment which he rents <laughs> that he's living there and that apartment had two bedrooms where we're going to scramble and we're <laughs> going to live inside that with their kids so the point here is i had this expectation of canada like this that people are going to be nice that i'm going to be rich the money's going to be just rolling in yeah. father's going to be making in dollars and what i didn't realize that if you make money in dollars you also spend money in dollars right but then the point that was worse was that um the uh, canadians the white canadians uh would make fun of our parents but but with clothing you're wearing mm. if mom and dad are walking on the street uh, mom is wearing like how do know, they make fun what do they say you know they would say packy go home you smell really yeah things like that they and, call you packy packy so packy was like a swear word from it started from pakistan so people from pakistan but then they looked at us and they didn't same it, color skin. same color so they basically and and it's not that the actual word packy was bad it's the conversation or the meaning behind it was your 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 you you smell you don't know what you're doing you're not you're uneducated you why do you put bindi on you like what's huh. wrong with you why do you wear clothes like this so go back to your own country and all that so these kind of things and it's also i can only imagine mother and father when they got to this new country mom doesn't speak english daddy barely speaks english and then now they're telling them yelling and screaming in front of the children and they can't do anything right it yeah. was probably very tough for them as well yeah. and also it was embarrassing for us uh, as well but in school i got bullied yeah, i can't speak english so i'm going there and and i you know they're teaching and they're like you're dumb because you don't speak english but the the thing is this um at in in canada the amazing part is they 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 do a great job in systems policing uh, uh, uh teaching schooling uh helping uh tutoring for free and all that mm. so grade 8 they came to me and said look you 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 you're you're not you're special <laughs> and when i felt they said a special i felt they meant that i was special but they well they meant you're dumb <laughs> okay okay so there was a special school that started from high school that started from grade 9 where special people go and my my guidance counselor says you can't go to regular school but you can go to special school i i recommend you go there i had no idea what that meant i said i said okay i ran home i said mom dad i'm going to a special school in high school <laughs> my dad is like shabash what the chat <laughs> but that first year i became smarter first time in my life i started liking school then i realized you can't be a police officer if you're in that school how are police officers paid well in canada very well they i i mean in comparison to uh, is there an incentive for them to get bribed is that does that happen a lot among canadian policemen i would say again one uh, percenter i would say 99.99% of the officers don't even think about getting bribes it's okay. just a, it's in, and in my entire 15 years of policing uh, i was a detective and i investigated one uh indian officer who was also police officer in canada mm. who was suspected of doing something like that but out of the 15 years not even one person ever did anything like that and mm. i would never even think about it uh, uh so when i left as a platoon commander uh in 19, in, in 2005 i was making about 100,000 a year really 100,000 yes. a year as a policeman yes. what year is this 
uh, 2005. So wait, let's just dial back where we were, right? So you moved from Delhi, you came to Canada. In Canada, you struggled to learn English. You could not do it. So then you went to a special school. Then from special school, you became like a topper. And then after that, you applied to the you after that you said to enter the police academy. So 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 what happened was uh, in 1990, um, uh, my father kept saying, "Go to university." Not because he okay. anything else, because he never went to university. Right. But it was because I can tell my uh, people that my son is went to university. Yeah. I mean, that's the number one reason why um, parents think that they are doing it for their kids by asking them to do engineering and doctor. But I would argue that they're doing it so that they look good in front of their friends. For sure, for sure. And and I also think that they love their kids and they feel genuinely that by doing that they're loving their kids more yeah. because because if they don't do it, then they are not parenting well. That's yeah. another thing. Yeah. So so. Uh, In 1990, uh, the last two years were so crucial for police force, and that's those are the two years that I did very really well. And then the the policing required me to have 75% average in my overall marks. Okay. Okay. I had 76, 77. So what happened was University of Toronto, York University Police Department, all three of them accepted me in 1990. All three okay. of them, which was. Like, like like it was like I have nothing 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 nobody wants me no one all of a sudden they all want me now tell me this right so I always wanted to know what exactly happens in the world of detective and solving cases right yes. because most people's idea of detective is either Sherlock Holmes that yes. we watch or it could be your CID and you know crime patrol and all of that but what is the reality can you maybe tell us a real story of sure. you cracking a case there was an Indian police officer who was uh, connected with the uh, A, a racket of uh, people who fix cars and then tow truck drivers and what the tow truck driver uh, you know people who tow your car to- okay okay, okay. Tow, so they call tow truck drivers and then they take the car to the uh, place where you mechanics or shops and what they do is they steal your car and then they chop off your car and they take all the f- good parts of the car okay how do they find the cars they steal it and then so I- so you park your car tow trucks come Pick it up, they drive it away, and then you go down and say, "Hey, I parked my car somewhere." And, and a group of Indians were doing this. So, so there were some people, and 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 police officer was involved. Indian so, police officer. Indian police officer, and that was the reason why it took so long to uh, catch him and do all these things because we then wiretapped, which is listening, because in those days there was no cell phones yet, or or the big cell phone had just come in, but nobody really had them. So it was landlines most of the time. So basically, the idea was. Police officers had to go inside your home, a bad guy's home, and they had to wiretap your phones, you know, listening to you, and then other parts if you work somewhere. So they had to do all these things. It's a beautiful system how they did it, and 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 now you can get to listen to them. And then yes. <laughs> once in a while, I would just walk into their shop pretending to be, a, you know, I would walk in like this pretending to be a customer, and so I can see. And then there was hidden cameras and mm. all that. So the idea was what they were doing is they were the police officer would be who can write a report hmm. and say yeah this car uh, we can't find this car. So the idea was car gets stolen and then that officer ha- happened to be the one who comes and investigates and then he writes it off and then insurance pays him. Right. So the insurance company is basically the victim at the end of the day. Hmm. So the v- insurance company has millions and millions and millions and billions of dollars. Hmm. So that's how it happened. But what happened was the insurance company kept looking at so many cars being destroyed and one officer was the one that was signing off and that's how they started to catch these issues. And uh um, Finally what happened to him? Finally uh he uh, he he went to jail and 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 he got fired and all that. And so that's basically the, uh, that was my 9 months of case and then somebody uh, in detective in that case said I like him. Uh, okay and then he said we have a drug case you want to come and and uh, my boss says no 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 he can't come and then somebody above my boss called them and say he Sunil will be coming so so what changed though? like why didn't why why didn't you not continue being a police officer so into the 13th year of my marriage 13th year of my marriage uh, my wife come, came to me and said we you know uh, we're going to have a divorce 13th unlucky number yeah and then uh, Well, I actually think 13 is a lucky number, but in this case I guess it was. And 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 so I we fought for 13th year, 14th year, and then 15th year is when I left the police force because um I recognized and realized I used to say my family is the most important part hmm. in the world. And 
perhaps I was acting like my job was the most important part. Yeah. So we've heard so much about, you know, your uh, police career and it seemed like a, a dream job. But yes. unfortunately, you had to now move from that into something else because you had to prioritize your family. So how did that shift happen? Because um, I'm just trying to put myself in your shoes, do 10, 15 years work as a police. And then what do I do next? Because all I've known is maybe combat and solving mysteries and stuff. Yeah, yeah. What do you do next? Yeah, as well as 15 years of and then 15 years of actual police work. And then uh, many years of in mind police work when I was a child, right? So it was huh. like way more than that. But so I'm confused now. I don't know what to do. And then one day, uh, and I started going to business shows, business events. And these two books come, came into my life. One was, one was uh, Think and Grow Rich. And the other one was th- uh, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I forced myself to read those books. So what are these business events that you attended? What were they? So uh, they would have entre- entrepreneurship uh, like uh, uh, events that happen in Toronto. They would who, be, who is conducting these kind some of Some people, I don't know. Just like what, like we did Growth Summit last week. I mean, it's somebody's conducting some sort of uh, sh- events. And these events, if it meant business, if it meant real estate, if it meant law of attraction, personal growth, anything, any of those events, I just kept going to them. Hmm. So I opened up a newspaper and there's the double page spread of this guy said Robert G. Allen. And he says, buy properties, no money down. Okay. And I, what kind of stupid idea is this? I threw the paper away. Huh. It uh, seemed very gimmicky. Stupid. Yeah. It just felt like a scam actually. Huh. So then an hour later, somehow, and I don't read that newspaper, but just, you know, because it was so cheap to get that newspaper at home. Everybody kind of goes. Through, and I just, Hour later, I, then I just picked up the newspaper and I opened it in exactly the same spot. It showed up, buy property, no money down. Long story short, I decided to go there. It was a free seminar and mm-hmm. I invested, which uh, which I had never done in the past. How much? Five thousand dollars was in two thousand five. Giving five thousand was that like a big amount of money for you back then? It would it was it would be like fifty thousand dollars for me, or maybe hundred thousand dollars today. No, but but tell me this: How do you invest in real estate without money? I did something that I had never thought I would do. Uh, I wrote down because I read it in a book. You have to write your goal. So I wrote down: I Sunil Tulsiani will make two hundred thousand dollars by this date. Signed it and dated it. When I wrote that, I will make two hundred thousand dollars. It meant that would be like me climbing Mount Everest and more. And, uh, and I'll explain how I did it. And so I took that course and with three months. So what is this course about the real estate investment? Yeah, it's called nothing down, no money down. Okay. Buying properties, no money down, which I threw that newspaper away. And Robert Allen and I have now become friends and, uh, you know, and he calls me now his mentor uh, because I've helped him in his business. So, but in those days, Robert Allen's $5,000 course is how in three months and not in one year, I made $200,000 first time in my life. And I said to myself, holy, like I was like, you know what? It worked. I'm like, I wonder if it works for a million dollars. If you had written a million dollars. Yeah. And I said, I always want to be a millionaire. Hmm. I took out the 200, three months later, because I made 200,000. I took off all the sheets. I made 16 sheets. Don't ask me why 16. Just made 16 sheets. What sheets? Piece of paper and took a marker. I, Sunil Tulsiani, will make $1 million by this date, signed it and dated it. And I put it everywhere in my house. 16 times. You know, 16. But it just happened that 16 sheet happened. People ask me why 16. But it's just basically I ran out of space, I guess. And that mm-hmm. was 16. So where I work out, in kitchen, in the washroom, on the mirror, we open the drawers in the closet, left side, right side, everywhere I am. I basically said, where do I spend most of my time? Hmm. And that's where I put it up. And um, I tell this on the stage that I ended up not making a million dollars. I ended up making about $980,000 in my first year. Wow. And uh, when was this? This was in 2005, 2006. Okay. It's a lot of money. And I mean, even today, it's a lot of money. It's a lot if I was of money. A officer, but in those days, because I had never seen something like that, it meant like, wow. And then what en- ends up ended up happening was people, uh, uh, the media started calling me. They heard about me and they started calling me the wealthy cop. Huh. That was the tagline today. People call me the wealthy cop. So they, can you tell us how did that happen? Though, yes, the- I will. But when the media called me, 
I would hang up on them because I was shy. Hmm. And then um, uh, my friend said, you know, you should open up a club. Okay. And I said, what is a club? He said, real estate club. I said, what's a real estate club? They go, no, oh, people gather to get there. They network, they meet, and they, they do business together. People learn from the speakers. I said, that's all good idea, but who's going to teach them? And they said, you. I said, me? No way. Hmm. I'm shy. Nah, nah, nah. So that was the birth of Private Investment Club. And what I want to share with you is the fact that how some of the strategies that I used from that course right. to do this. And then the next questions, next question that people get in their mind, yes, but that was in Canada, hmm. not in India. It yeah. cannot happen in India. So can we get into the like the full technical details? Like how does somebody get into real estate um, without you know investing money of sure. their own money? Like how does that work? It's 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 quite simple. If you've seen um, uh, now, uh, Shark Tank India has become very famous uh, as well. So let's imagine Shark Tank India for real estate. That's where my club is basically. Hmm. It's almost like Shark Tank India version of real estate, really. So let's say. I teach you how to find motivated sellers that sell properties below market value. Okay. This is the most, this is the nooks of the, 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 the course hmm. in detail as to what words to use, how to find them, how to find motivated sellers, why people become motivated sellers, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, a strategy you use to find them, what kind of marketing you use to find them. If you're driving down the road and and and, and a, a builder, you meet a builder who needs to sell twenty or thirty properties. You drive down and there's a person who's getting a divorce and they're fighting and they just like throw. They just want to let it go for a better price. So the first concept is you must find properties below market value. Then the second concept is you have to find money for it. So let's mm -hmm. say if you have the money, that's easy. You don't have the money. I bought and sold 77 properties the first year alone, mm -hmm. which is why they call me the wealthy couple. But how do you find such properties? Like, it's that, isn't that difficult to finding undervalued? It's like finding an undervalued stock. And now that financial information I already have, it's publicly available. So I can just pull it out, uh, quickly screen some stocks and find out, find, find them out. But in real estate, that data is not very transparently available. So how do you do it? How do you find those undervalued houses? So the difference between stocks and real estate is this. In stocks, insider trading is illegal hmm. all over the world. Right. In real estate, insider trading is legal. Okay. Okay. So, um, for example, if I uh, learned, okay, if I'm driving... Uh, my route and I see a house and that house looks dirty, it ha grass hasn't been cut, it looks something is an issue. And then then I teach them how to find the owner of that and contact them and say, I want to buy your house. I want to put an offer in your house for in next 48 hours. Okay, hmm. 48 hours, I'll buy your house. If So these are people not that they want to sell, they need to sell. Whereas in the stocks, it's you don't get that information. And if you do let's say your family is putting up a new stock, uh, you know, IPO and all. The, the insider trading is not allowed. Let's say in real estate, uh, you know somebody and know somebody says, you know, uh, uh, 10 kilometers from here, we're going to uh, do something in this area. A highway is going to come, new, ah. whatever is going to come. That information, when the sign comes up, it's too late. Most people wait for the sign. But what if you knew the What do you mean sign? Okay, the sign the of that post, happening. The, the post and, the high, and, and news and all that saying, hey, you know, Prime, Prime Minister Modi is doing this in this area. It's too late from our point of view. Now, even then when people buy it, still they're going to make money. But the being on the inside means you buy it at wholesale. So how do you have access to this kind of data? I'm sure it's not just publicly told, right? I'm, no. It's, it's, it has to come through government bodies, right? This information. It comes from government bodies. It also comes from influencers. It also comes from insider clubs, like private investment club. We have okay. some, some it's insiders. They come in. They know some of these stuff. They don't share with all the people. Okay. Like, you know, it's like insiders. So great, great thing about real estate is that, you know, it's not, le it's not illegal. 
it's completely legal so basically there are some people who are maybe friends with people who work in the government yes. and they heard it from somebody so that information comes through yes. and then that is maintained and within a close knit group of right. people that's right and because you have access to this information of what's going to happen in the future and the entire whole world doesn't know that which is this is if this sort of thing happens in the stock market it's called insider trading yes. but because it doesn't happen in uh, because in, it's legal in real estate that's an opportunity to make that's money that's right so the so the, this is one thing the other thing that the regular person basically does is learns the signs of people who are motivated sellers meaning they they like i said one of the options was you drive down and you look at all the houses nice 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 ugly something is up something is wrong with that that's one the other one is marketing you can say okay i buy ugly houses or i buy you know dirt bad houses or i buy challenging houses or whatever it is or do you need to sell are you getting you know so somebody who gets a job who lives here but he needs to leave fast to some other city and they must sell so there are a lot of instances like this which keep happening not lot but the point here is there's enough for you to make lots of money from hmm. okay and also what happens is some people are willing and wanting to buy beautiful properties everybody can buy beautiful property that these ones are not beautiful properties nobody wants to take a uh, not beautiful property property because most people are buying it to live in it yes uh, but people like you were buying it to flip it flip it or to uh, even rent it out or to do other things with it to redevelop so, it a little bit and then yes. sell it for higher price that's right so um, we would bring in for example we know that the most people who live in a house uh, uh women really makes the decision from a point of view whether i want this house or not men sometimes if they're earning they're making the decision how much is it but it's the woman who walks into the home mm. now if there's 10 houses and she has to look at it the man is going to say you know in relatively doesn't matter but women is going to go so then what we do is we study what does a woman want at the end of the day it's the kitchens and at the washrooms mm. so women are actually the decision makers here. so what we used to do is we used to buy ugly properties and we knew in advance what that ugly property will require to look like a beautiful property for a woman hmm okay and sometimes spending $10,000 $20,000 in a kitchen would mean that you have elevated the price of the house by $50,000 hmm. because in the eyes of you paint the whole thing and you make a beautiful granite countertop kitchen for a woman and put nice uh, stove nice fridge in there we buy the fridge for them we buy the stove for them we buy the nice microwave in there we spend 10 15000 and they are in there and the woman walks in and she looks at the kitchen and it's all done for her <laughs> and all she says is i don't know why but i like the house <laughs> and then she the next thing that she sees is the washroom so we rip out the old toilet put the new toilet new uh, you know uh, tiles the shower heads we oh, we change all the door knobs mm. to make it look nice beautiful and we spend sometimes 2 dollars more to get a better door knob than mm. what we, she's used to maybe 5 dollars more and then she's like oh i like so she doesn't say i like the door knob like this what happens is she, her mind is picking up this is beautiful it's a combination of multiple things which sort of psychologically tells her that something is right about this place yes and and then she's buying with emotions right right yeah. because if she she can ima- she can imagine being so what when when i used to go there as an investor i would say to them both of you come they come in and i would say this this is the word i use as nlp which is this to the women i said imagine your your family is sitting over there and imagine this kitchen where do you think you would be cooking and she was like, i would be sitting here i would be doing here she already bought the house hmm <laughs> she's she saying all those yeah things. she's already bought the house about that house. and she's willing to pay more mm-hmm. like if her husband gets you know this is like you know punch, there's 5 lakh rupees more here 10 lakh rupees more then mm-hmm. we can buy it. she's like no i want this one hmm doesn't matter so i got into this and 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 and, and the getting back to uh somebody finds a good deal and now money is needed So so what happens is imagine there's a sh- shark tank show and there are sharks so let's say I'm one of the sharks in my club okay, okay. Huh. I teach you what properties I want you come to me and you say to me I found the property that you're looking for and I look at it and I'm go wow this is amazing I give you 100% of the money mm. including acquisition including legal cost including fix up cost including everything he or she puts nothing just like in shark tank shark tank i have this idea 
this cup is the best. And the shark says, okay, I'll give you all the money. But when they're doing a shark tank, that's pretty scary because it's an idea. With the real estate, I already know that real estate is worth this much. They're buying it for this much. When we fix it up, it's going to be worth more. I already have a security. Hmm. And I put a lien, legal lien on the property if I lend you the money. Hmm. Which means that you can't sell the property without your permission. Pay me. So you cannot okay. get scammed. That's right. So so basically both parties are winning here. So for a party which does not have the money, or the individual who doesn't have money but wants to get into real estate, you teach this person how to identify these undervalued properties in his or her city. And then they come to you because you guys are the ones, there's another group of people who have the money to fund it. So both of them work together and both of them make money. Correct. One is an active, the other one is passive. Yeah. So when I teach uh, in entrepreneurship is that you should have active income, but you should also set up passive income strategies. Hmm. So when you're not working, when you're breathing, the money comes in. Hmm. So uh, for me, it becomes active, uh, passive. For them, they do all the work. I oversee it. I might come in every week and look at it. Yes, they did this, this. So usually how much is this investment amount in Canada for a person who wants to play the passive role? Uh, and if this is happening in India, what would that amount be to play the passive role of just investing? I, I think, um, for example, uh, if you say India, uh, if you're going to buy something in Madhya Pradesh or you're going to buy something in Ahmedabad or you're going to buy something in Delhi or Mumbai, it's going to be completely different. So, for example, in Ahmedabad, you can buy a flat for 50 lakh rupees. And make what kind of returns on that if you have to do this thing? See, here, if somebody's got a flat that's worth 75 lakhs, and I had a one of my members in India, actually uh, in um, in somewhere in Punjab, he uh, he learned and then he went out and he bought a property below market value. Then he got an investor to put all the money in, mm. and, and and the property was 1.3 CRs, and he got it for 85 lakhs. Because it was in distress. It's distress. Because the person wanted to sell really bad. Absolutely. And then it had 10 rooms, and then with the 10 or 12 rooms. And with the, rooms in a flat? Uh, in uh, 12 rooms in a big flat. Okay. Yeah. So what he did was he turned them into PGs. Ah, okay. Okay. And each PG was paying him 12,000 rupees. 12,000 times 12,000 12, times 12 is 144, 1 lakh, 45 lakh rupees per month. Mm. The income. Okay. And he got it at, after he fixed it and everything, still got it at 15% below market value. So if he wanted to sell it, he basically could have just sold it and still made 15, 20 lakh rupees like that. But he didn't want to do it. He wants to make karor. He wants okay. to wait. So that's an example of if it's Delhi versus, you know, my little town, Katni, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's, you know, price will be completely different, right? How much, how much is it in Katni? I don't know, maybe 30 lakh rupees or something like that. You can buy a, probably a house for 40, 50 lakh rupees. So, but would you say that the opportunity to do this has somewhat uh, dissipated in metro cities or is it still there? It's there because it all depends on the motivated seller. Because even in metro cities now, uh, the builders are not able in Mumbai, Delhi, they're not, when they put up a big building these days, they don't have a lineup of people of buying their new homes, uh, condos anymore or, yeah. or apartments. So that has slowed down. And now the uh, builders are reducing the price or they're giving incentives. Yeah. And that's when you because know. Because I feel like the prices in metro cities, the top five cities of India, they have kind of uh, you know skyrocketed and reached almost course. bubble territory in these top five cities. But in their other cities of India, like you said, there are many opportunities. Absolutely. So, but when many people think of real estate, uh, and because most of the audience here live in these top five cities, they are like, okay, so much money. Uh, I'm hearing so many stories of people making money in real estate. Let me just buy this house and live in it. So that lot of gap in understanding of what real estate as an investment is and what real estate as a lifestyle expenses. Because most people confuse buying a house making it up and living in it with your family as an investment. Like, what are your thoughts around that? Well, look, um, in, um, like, I, my friend Robert Kiyosaki says uh, that your house is your liability. Hmm. In, in my case, uh, I agree with him almost everything. But in this case, uh, I, I believe that if you have to live somewhere and if the rental price 
and the purchase price monthly payment. So in Canada, for example, which is different from India, yeah, the 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 monthly cost was similar, not the same. The rental might be two thousand, and this would be twenty five hundred dollars to own a place. Yeah. So I would own the place. Of course. That's one. That's the second reason I would own a place is that let's say I bought a. Uh, so basically, you're missing on the EMI and the rent is somewhat similar. similar. Then, of course, buying a house makes, makes sense. sense. And that's what has happened in U.S. and Canada for yeah. many, many years. Uh, because we were getting the mortgages at 2%, 3%. Right. Okay. It, it just made no sense to rent. Yeah. Um, so one of my houses that I bought was uh, $780,000 and it's $2.5 million today. Okay. okay. Great thing about that, I pay zero income tax. If well, you live in that house. Oh, right, right. Okay. So I don't know in India it's like that or not, but if you buy a house for one crore and then it turns into five crore rupees and you sell it uh, in Canada and you in the United States, you pay zero taxes because it's your principal residence. Here we pay zero only if you buy another house with that money. Okay, but with me, with, with ours, you can take that money and do whatever you want with That's it. That's not allowed. Yeah. You have to buy another house. So 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 even then, what I'm trying to say to you, and then eventually you have to pay taxes then. Right. Okay. Exactly. And in, in, in our case, it's so beautiful. You buy a house for a million dollars, and then tomorrow you sell it for $2 million, you will take $2 million white money and pay no tax. Really? That's that's how nice it is? Yes. No tax for that? No. If it's a principal residence. Mm. Okay. So... That's why uh, some of the things don't work globally. So what Kiyosaki is talking about generally is that, you know, if uh, you buy something and you're paying so much more yeah. and you're renting this here, then then he actually... But then what I so, ask this so question. In, in people in India, if I could give you an example, I understand that in US and Canada, the rent and the EMI is somewhat similar. Uh, but in India, what happens is if you are renting the place, it's probably 20% of your 20 to 30% of your monthly income. But if you're buying the place, the EMI is probably 60% of your monthly so income. So basically double. Yeah, sometimes triple as well. Triple, okay. Then I say to you is, um, if you are making money, if you're making, like in your job, your business, you're bringing, money's coming, and you can afford to live in a house that you're going to buy, hmm. chances are, five to 10 years from now, you will be head. Chances are. I will be? Head of the game. Ahead you would, of the game. You would make money because... Um, rent will go into garbage, and then, and then, what do you do? So, what do most people do? They they have some money. They end up buying Gucci, and they go and buying all that stuff, right. and then that dissipates. So, how savvy you are if you're rented, and now you have this extra money, which you're not going to blow off. You're yeah. Invest. What are you going to do with? But, but then, what do you do with that money? That matters. Of yeah, course. matters, right? Of course. So, if you can get that money that you have extra, and you can make more than the appreciation of the house that you would have bought, right. then you could win. Right. So let's say you take that money and you say, I have this business idea, right? Yeah. And 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 maybe the first year you get 50% ROI on your money, 50, 5, 0, because you're working, mm. it's business. Then don't buy the house, then do the business. Mm. Because business is a machine that brings the cash flow, mm. in my my view. Right. So, so that's, of course. that's what it is. So... Basically, it's like, what do you do with that money? Do you create a machine which makes more money? Or do you buy a house and live in it, which and that house doesn't make you money anymore? That's right. That's the question you need to ask yourself. And my, my question, my answer to that is that do whatever brings cash flow. Yeah. Cash flow has to be the most 100%. valuable thing. And most people don't do that. Most people, what they do is, uh, like if I had to break uh, people into three categories, poor, middle class, and rich. The poor people, they get their money, which is their income. And then all of that goes into expenses. The middle class people, they get their money. That's the inflow of cash flow. That's their salary. It goes into liabilities like cars and houses. And then that again becomes expenses and everything is out. So that pipe goes out. What the rich people do is they take their salary, put it into assets, which could be maybe buying a house and giving it for rent. One of the simplest examples. Or you make a business which makes more money. You reinvest in your education, which makes more money. That asset generates more money to our income. Yes. Instead of going into the expense column. Yes. And that is the mistake which most people make. They don't understand that. But the last, last example I just t told you, it's not that easy to do, right? It's, it, re it requires sacrifices. It requires delaying gratification, saying that I will not buy the car, expensive car. Now I'll delay that. I will not buy the house. Now I'll delay that. But most people are so, uh, you know, behind these material wealth that they cannot make that decision to delay. And as with everything in life, if you cannot delay gratification, you'll all, you will eventually lead an unhappy life. 
Yeah, and uh, the important part is that uh, in 2023, you know, we're in uh, September of 2023, I would say the best time for you to become wealthy in real estate, best time for you to become wealthy in entrepreneurship, and best time for you to have business growth is here. Okay, yeah. and we are in India no longer the PRA people who are saying, in order for me to be rich, I have to go to US yeah. or I have to go whatever, Canada, whatever. India is now time for India. India is here. Yeah. Our time for uh, India has the opportunity that they never had in the past as much as they have today, at least in my lifetime. Yeah. So it's an opportunity. If you're sitting there thinking, you know, I'm, I'm in India, do I have to go to the United States? The answer is no. Actually, the opportunities are here now. You yeah. can make crores and crores here, right here in India by helping people all over the world by using simple your phone, right? you know, your internet and your computer. That's basically what I would suggest that people do. And, and, and I would suggest get people get uh, education. Hmm. And I get education, not colleges, university per se, uh, as much as getting it from live events like the ones hmm. we put up together because right. they're taught by mentors rather than teachers. So let me, let me phrase this question, right? So that it's easier for the audience. Let's say I'm a 25 to 30 year old uh, person living in India today, maybe 25 to 35. I'm working a job which I feel like I'm not fully satisfied with it. And uh, I have two problems in my life. One is how do I make more money? And two is how do I reach a point where money is not controlling me? Uh, in a country like India today, what would you what would you say for them that they should do over the next 10 years? That's good. Good. Very good point. First is we talked about the education and I wanted to tell you, know, I mean, I talked about science of getting rich. I mean, this book, like I said, I've read the original one 50 or 60 times. Mm -hmm. And and then I spent over 500 hours doing this book. And what I like to do is, you know, for your audience, 25 to 35 year old, uh, not only is a book, but there's 20 audio uh, uh, audios and 20 videos made on this book that I did it with my mentee. So I like to gift it to everybody. So, you know, mm. everybody, it's going to be a digital version and then you can I'll, just put I'll it. Take this. Yes, this is for you, physical one. <laughs> but you can have the book, the audios, audio books and the videos absolutely free from me um, because it is universal. So first is educate yourself constantly secondly upgrade you upgrade yourself every day hmm. and you're an asset or a liability by the way you treat yourself no, but when you say education what are those key things which they should educate themselves on um entrepreneurship sales marketing communication skills so basically sort of like an mba degree but not mba no because mba degree what happens is it's being taught by teachers that don't have multi-million dollar businesses Hmm. So learn from the people who have businesses. Difference between teachers and mentors. But there's no formalized system yet for these kind of stuff. Yes. Like, so so attend the live events, real events hmm. where you learn from somebody who has done it. Makes so sense. So in the old uh, in the olden days when I was not a good student and there was a good student sitting in front of me, I would be friend with this person. I would say, you know, during the exam, can you just help me a little bit? And if they during the exam he shows me a few things and I copy it. And during the exam, if a teacher catches me, I would be in big trouble, uh, especially me, I would be in big trouble. In the real world, this is the best and the fastest way to become rich. Copying Find others, somebody yeah. who has done it, yeah. has the results, copy them. Yeah. Copy them. And, and, and for me, for 25 to 35 year old people, I, I want you to ask yourself, what is it that I love? The plurking aspect. Plurking is P-L-E-R-K-I-N-G. Playing and working, combining together. What is so it that I love? This is the word that you created? I just created this word. It just okay. came to me. Okay. And all over the world, I teach about plurking. And I gave you an example before uh, when we were having lunch is that plurking is, a, uh, is, is, a, is not, it's not a plurking if uh, there's a doctor who is a doctor, but uh, he's making lots of money, but he's not enjoying himself. He was told to be a doctor. Plurking can be, plurking is also not, uh, an artist who's so good at it, he enjoys himself, he loves it, he's living his life, but then he's poor. Mm. So in both of these cases, it's not plurking. For me, plurking means I love what I'm doing, like what I'm doing, like right now when you see me on the stage, when you see me doing this, this is, this is like people go, that's your work. I don't feel like this is my work. Mm. I just love it. And I'm making lots of money. 
I make okay. lots of money from doing. So plurking is doing something and making money. Plurking is uh, you, when the time just flies and you're successful. Just to summarize, the first thing that every 25 to 35, 35 year old who wants to get out of the you know the rat race get my book <laughs> yeah, get out of the rat race is to get your book and to educate themselves of something that they can plug with. Meaning they need to find something that they um, uh, enjoy to do and for them to upskill themselves in that educate themselves on that and learn it from people who already done it before. So That's find right. such people, if they have their own workshops or webinars, attend it and learn from that. That's so number one. That's right. What's the second thing that they so, so first is the books. Okay. Second is to attend the events. And, uh, and, and once you attend the events, only listen to people who have what you want. Hmm. Very, people very, who've done that, done, done been it, there, done that. Done it. Now, the third thing is, think about, let's say you attend a few different business opportunities. Ask yourself, not which one, makes money first. Ask yourself, which one of those got you excited? What really gets you excited? Would you be able to do this every day? Well, mm. When I was buying Subway Sandwich business, I, I, my, 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 one of my friends says, before buying, why don't you talk to some of these franchises? So I went and talked to some of the franchises and, I, and this guy who was making sandwich, I bought a sandwich from him and I said, so do you love it? And he goes, if you made 500 sandwiches a day, cutting, putting the same thing again, would you love it? I said to myself, oh my God, there's no way I'm going to be happy doing this thing. And that was it. Okay. So what, what I was looking at, each sandwich, $10 times 500, this much money. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. That's what I was looking at. So the point here is, say to yourself, the third thing is, what do I love? Apart from real estate, is there any other opportunities that are available out there? Because you talk to so many businesses, yeah. right? What other opportunities are there that... Uh, the rising middle class of India can explore as a side hustle. Think about um, what's your uh, favorite hobby, it's the favorite thing to do. Do you love writing? Do you like copywriting? Do you like developing, you know, some apps, websites? Mm. Um, but the challenge is most people do not have tried any of these things. So how would I know what to choose if I've not even tried it? Yeah, so so it's, it's, it's a very good question. All you do is go on to Google and YouTube and see how many people are there. So let's say you want to do health coaching. Mm. You know, like, okay, I'll, I, you know, post-pandemic, I know a lot of people have health issues, mental issues or whatever issues, and you like, this is the best. So actually, it is actually one of the growing field is becoming a coach, consultant, mentor. Mm. So let's say you uh, have some skills and you want to coach others. You know, and you want to you want to help me lose 10 kgs. You know, these kind of things are very valuable post pandemically. Mm, right. So you go, is there are there people who are making lots of money doing that? And and it's very, because we have the Internet, it's so easy to go on YouTube and say, oh, there's 10 million videos on this. Well, there, you know, that's pretty good. Oh, actually, there's no video on this. Then you'll know very fast. Mm. So that's one thing. Then you will have to learn the skills of sales and or the marketing or both. Mm. And marketing is simply getting strangers to come to you. That's it. And then when they come to you, then you sell. When you sell it to them, that's selling. So all businesses are marketing, sales, delivering the service. Marketing, sales, delivery service. That's mm. it. Mm. Every business, if you look at it, that's the bottom line. So, so, and then between, let's say you can build a brand, for example, for yourself. You know, uh, and maybe you 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 dress in certain way, you talk in certain way, you improve your communication skills. But at the end of the day, don't do what your parents and teachers told you, which is don't talk to your strangers. You talk to strangers. Mm. You attract the strangers. They're the buyers. So, and you have to become C A M C A M C A M stands for client attraction machine. Client attraction machine, because no business grows. Hmm. If you have no clients, and you can't serve them if you can't if they don't pay you, you can't serve them. So you're like, okay, you know what? I'm weak at talking. Okay, start with the books if you don't have lots of money. You can even do start with YouTube. You have zero money. Book. And that's how I started. I even I couldn't know didn't know how to shoot videos. Yeah, I actually YouTube yeah. how to talk to talk in front of a camera. Exactly. That's how I started. And look where you are today, yeah. right? It's amazing. And then of course you probably had learned more as you went on. So books. Then 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 there's some online courses people can take. Then they can take uh, they can attend live events whether it's virtual or, or in person. Then they can hire a mentor. That's the highest level. Highest level is I want to be a warrior. I want to be a money warrior. And there's a money warrior. 10,000 years ago, same formula. I want to be a black belt in karate. 
Okay, great. Where's the black? That person has more than a black belt in karate. But that person is going to teach me. It's like us going to unhealthy person and saying, teach me to become black belt. This is what happens all over the world. We go to a bank teller awesome. and say, how do I, bec- how do I make a million dollars uh, when I retire? And she says, buy in this place, buy here, buy here, buy here. And you ask her or him, do you have this stuff? Huh. And they may not even have it. And they are definitely not rich. So you uh, think about this way. Teachers are here or mentors are here. And mentors are people who have it, done it, who, have, who are doing what they're teaching you. Hmm. Teachers are repeating what they learned. Hmm. They're both important, but this is the next level. Makes sense. If you want to be rich, do what I do in my company, which is this. If you give me 100 rupees, I will give you 200 rupees worth of value, minimum. And if you go with that mindset, you can never be selfish. If you made a million dollars and you, that was your formula, that means you have given over $2 million worth of value to the world. Hmm. So you're always going to be like you have given more than what you have received in paper. So go with the intent of, I'm going to give double the value to the world, triple yeah. the value, 10 times the value. What happens in the world is that I'm going to take the money and I'm not going to give the value even that I promised. Hmm. Okay. That's not what you do. Even if you're an employee, when you go to work, give more than what you're getting paid for. Yeah. What happens a lot of times with employees is that initially they're working hard, hard, hard. Yeah. And then, then they're like, let's just coast. Right. And when the time comes to fire people, they're the ones who go first. Right. I had an assistant who um, basically uh, left for two weeks on vacation. Hmm. And I never noticed that she went away for two weeks. I had like three or four assistants. Okay. So when she came back, she said, oh, my God, I, you know, I went away for two weeks. And inside I was like, you went for two weeks? I didn't even know. You want an assistant that says, I'm going. And the next day I feel it. I'm like, where is this person? Hmm. That person will not be fired right. or will be the fire the last. Also, there is this uh, interesting math around this, right? So in most organizations, employee cost is like 20 to 30 percent of your top line, which is revenue. So by math or logic, if an employee is not giving three times the value of what he or she is paid, they're not really adding value to the company. They're becoming a pure cost center. So for an employee to truly f- uh, want to feel like, hey, uh, I'm, I'm getting paid so much and I'm adding so much value, which is equivalent to my pay, your boss will never know about it. That's right. But if you are adding two times of what you're getting paid or three times of what you're getting paid, only then you get noticed. That's and right. And that is a fundamental thing that most people don't realize. They think that they only deserve to work as hard as they're getting paid. But for you to actually make an impact for the decision makers, you will need to work two times of what you're getting paid. Yes. Then it makes an impact. I would say to you, let's do this. I would say, say to yourself, I'm, I'm a human being. I was born on this planet. I'm here to serve, okay? Why don't I make this uh, an idea whether I'm an employee, Hmm. whether I'm a real estate investor or I'm an entrepreneur, that I'm here to serve the world. So forget about whether I get noticed or I don't get noticed or whatever like that. You will get noticed, but let's just say that's a secondary. First thing, go with the intent and mindset and heart set. Mindset and heart set, which is this. I'm going into this to serve. So what you do is you, you make yourself so important to the clients of that company yeah. as well as to the company that that company has no choice but to say, I cannot work without you. To become a key employee. You become, and then other employees or, or competitors or somebody comes along and says, how do I get that person come yeah. to my thing? You know what? I'll pay you double. Come yeah. to my. Makes sense. All right. So Sunil, what would you like to end this discussion with? What would you like to give our audience for staying till the end? I, I would say that uh, if you um, would love to have this book, Science of Getting Rich, it's more than 500 hours of my time to put this in there for you. Uh, videos, audios, you can have this. And How do the videos and audios include in the book? Yeah, so there's a link for people to get. So that's all free. That. It's all free. Everything is free. I'm just gifting you guys. But the to, book is not free, right? Book is free too. How is the book free? The, everything is digital. So oh. I'll give you a link. I'll give you a link. Okay. You just put the link into your, uh, into your, uh, maybe. Sure. So sh- he'll put a link. I hope he uh, does. Uh-huh. And um, so the book is free. Videos are free. Audio is free, everything is free. The entire package is completely free. Yeah. So this is a him adding value. I'm getting 
you know, absolutely. Get nothing back. <laughs> it's 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 it, the whole point here is, yeah. you know, during COVID, I saw so many people losing their businesses, and I felt it that I got to do something, and then this is what the creation during, mm. that, you know, when we were locked up, this is all I was doing. Yeah, and uh, so that's number one. Number two is that if you, um, you know, my my website is privateinvestmentclub.com, mm. and uh, if you want to send an email, it's admin at private investment club. My yeah. assistant will have that. So if you're thinking of anything about entrepreneurship, real estate, or you want to just say hello or anything like that, that's the place where you go and and follow me on my. Uh, uh, YouTube uh, as well as LinkedIn or any other social media by putting my name. Where are you most active on? Um, YouTube and LinkedIn. YouTube and LinkedIn. Yeah, YouTube and LinkedIn. All right. Guys, thank you so much for watching till the end. I hope this was a wonderful session for you as enlightening as it was for me. Thank you so much for being part of this episode. You're welcome.